So hello everyone. Uh, I wanted to welcome you back from lunch um, for the evening, um, for the afternoon and the evening of this lovely conference workshop. Uh, my name is Anupama Rao. I am a historian and an anthropologist uh, who works on South Asia, on India in particular. I'm also the associate director of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. And this has some bearing on why and how I'm here today. Uh, both uh, Laura and Dare and the Center for Spatial Research have kind of pulled me, um, a textually trained, um, I guess, historian and somebody who does some amount of ethnographic field work into this kind of enchanting world of urban humanities and uh, spatial mapping and data visualization and have taught me a lot about thinking about questions of, I think, history, theory, and politics in, in really different ways um, because of the kind of interface and the kinds of questions that they've been asking. So I really want to thank them for pulling me into this world. I am a uh, neophyte, but I think a somewhat enthusiastic traveler. Um, I also wanted to just take a chance to think a little bit about the, um, some of the questions and concerns um, of, the, of the morning and especially the wonderful keynote that we had by Wendy Chun and um, how that might also stage some of our conversations for the rest of the day. And so I just wanted to throw a couple of things um, out there very quickly. One is that it seems to me that we've been thinking um, about the question of history, of theory and politics um, in very different yet interconnected ways throughout the day. This also has some bearing on the way that we think about questions of description, of analytics, and of methodology. And people have come into these questions um, with different levels of emphasis. Um, but the other thing that people seem to be really interested in thinking about is uh, the ways in which spatial unevenness is a material manifestation of capital, of capital's work, whether we think of it as colonial, post-colonial, or neoliberal. And, um, and as part of this, one of the things that I've heard a lot of uh, is a kind of binary and or a dialectic uh, and or an overcoming, I don't know what kinds of terms you want to use for this, but a way of thinking about the relationship between system and structure on the one hand, and then questions of informality, of defacement, of improvisation, resilience. I didn't hear the word resistance, but perhaps that too and the political question of what all this means, how we think about making do, on the one hand, with the systems that we inherit and inhabit, and then the questions of really profound and or minute change that's possible within those, um, within those spaces. Um, for myself as well, I just want to throw this out as a kind of question or a concern. Um, and this really has to do with the relationship, speaking of spatial unevenness, the relationship between the global north and the global south. Um, and it seems to me that it's, uh, I'm not very clear yet whether we think of the Global South as merely a case, whether it's a diagnostic, whether it's a dystopia, whether it actually contains lessons and parables for the world that we inhabit increasingly in the Global North. But I don't think that the relationship between the Global South and the Global North is one of equivalence. Um, but there's been a way in which there's been a kind of a, a, a politics of comparison that I want to ask about, and about historical comparison. So are we seeing a moment of primitive accumulation, um, of a moment of a kind of you know, originary violence? Is this a reset? How do we really think the histories of the present? Um, it seems to me with some more attention to um, the world of the global south. Um, this is my own concern, but this is just to put this out there for the rest of the day. And I want to use that as a way to introduce this panel, which is going to be focused on the question of history, of other spaces, of the archive, of memory, documentation, and installation. Uh, and I'm going to quickly introduce our three speakers for uh, the afternoon. Um, so the first, and this will be in the order, I think, of their presentations as well. The first is Robert Gerard Petrusco, who is a cartographer and composer who's based in Somerville, Massachusetts. His work explores contemporary technologies of measurement, of simulation and visualization, and their relationship to the production of space. He's an assistant professor of architecture and landscape architecture at Harvard's uh, GSD. The next is Nonti Sekelelo Mutiti, 
who is a Zimbabwean-born interdisciplinary artist and educator. He was trained at Zimbabwe's Institute of Digital Arts and also has an MFA from the Yale School of Art. Recently, she's been a resident artist at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. Um, and in 2015, she was awarded the Joan Mitchell Foundation Emerging, Emerging Artist Grant in its inaugural year. And like all the people on our panel, she has participated in many shows, curated many of them, um, and uh, has got an extensive body of work. Uh, she produces project-based works uh, as a founder member of the Black Chalk and Company Collective and with Tinashe Mushakavanshu, which is a collective of writers, artists, curators, and educators. And then Simone Brown is in the Department of Sociology at the University of Austin. She's also the Associate Professor in the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies. Her first book, Dark Matters, on the surveillance of blackness, examines surveillance with a focus on transatlantic slavery, biometric technologies, branding, airports, and creative texts. She's an executive member of Hashtag and also a member of Deep Lab, which is a feminist collaborative. So please um, welcome all of our speakers, and it's really great to be here and to introduce you all. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm glad that I'm not directly following our keynote, that I'm following lunch. Lunch is a pretty good opening act uh, I've found in the past. So um, I do just want to um, uh, mention how inspiring I found all of the morning presentations. And uh, I'd like to thank Laura and Dare for having me here uh, to be part of this, um, and Anu for that, that fantastic introduction. Um, on receiving Laura's invitation to speak at a conference sponsored by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, on the topic of ways of knowing cities, it seemed like a good opportunity uh, to present an exhibition project that was part of the Harvard Mellon Urban Initiative. Um, this exhibition uh, was um, part of a four-year project um, that was done um, uh, in collaboration amongst numerous departments at Harvard on a project called Reconceptualizing the Urban. Uh, the PIs for this project were uh, urban historian Eve Blau and uh, Julie Buckler, a professor of Slavic languages. And it was imagined as a collaboration between the Graduate School of Design and uh, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences there. So um, the desire was to see what would happen if we treated the topic of urbanism um, through the lenses of design and uh, various humanities. Um, there were several courses that were developed, seminars and research courses that had uh, sort of field work and field studies. Uh, there were symposia, lecture series, and uh, a number of workshops on sort of collaborative methodologies, um, one of which I led on, on mapping for, uh, for people in the humanities. The, um, the sort of focus on urbanity used four portal cities um, to organize the work or the collaborative work um, for all the people involved with the project. Um, and by focus on the, uh, focusing on these cities, we um, wanted to kind of highlight the differences in methodologies that um, different types of scholars use, and um, specifically looked at what happened when we combined uh, designers with, uh, with experts in urban studies, historians, uh, people from comp lit, filled, um, excuse me, film studies, media studies, and, um, and all the rest of it. All the rest of it. <laughs> uh, as my collaborator, uh, Eve Blau, uh, often says of the project, is that uh, the city is a, a terrific site for collaborative work because no one discipline owns the city as a site of research. And each brings to their work a series of blind spots that a collaborative or heterodox form of research can help to address. The final portion of the initiative uh, was an exhibition project uh, co-curated by Eve and myself that would travel to the four portal cities uh, with the original goal of sort of presenting the results of the research on these cities uh, that had been accumulated over the four years. Um, with this project, it was sort of assumed that this research, um, by being kind of aggregated around four, four cities, would somehow be commensurable. Um, and specifically, 
uh, that um, we would be able to exhibit the work that was produced in the courses and the lectures and the symposia in, in sort of a legible or, or, and comprehensive fashion. However, um, uh, for months in planning that, uh, when the topic of the exhibition would come up in all of our meetings, all eyes would turn towards me and I could only shrug, uh, shrug uh, because it wasn't quite clear to me exactly how all of this material would come together. Um, and specifically, that uh, given that the exhibition was going to be uh, mounted from within the design discipline, um, how is it that we could use kind of tools of representation uh, that designers uh, are most accustomed to using without sort of uh, uh, falling into one of the blind spots that are sort of part of our discipline when we're looking at, at urban questions? So. Um, what we decided to do instead was focus on the visual media that was generated as part of the larger Mellon project and take all of this media, um, extract it from the research projects that uh, had used this media or, or um, uh, extract it from the projects uh, that had generated it and see if there was new types of storytelling about the cities that could be told through the media that was generated um, across the four-year project. So it wasn't simply telling the stories um, of like various research papers that were generated. It was taking all of the material that had sort of come out of these different settings, putting them into a large repository, and then asking the experts from the various disciplines uh, focus on these cities, what types of new stories could be told when we combined all of the, all of the visual media that was kind of generated across the disciplines. Um, we ended up deciding on a, a, a sort of form of spatial montage through which um, a multidisciplinary audience might interpret the city differently. And by com combining this material as a form of sort of uh, spatial temporal cartography. Um, so my goal is to just uh, show you uh, some of the work that came out of this by focusing on the exhibition itself. Um, but before I do that, I kind of want to engage in uh, a cartographic preamble. So returning to the claim uh, that each discipline has its own blind spots, um, as I said before, we uh, wanted to not ensnare uh, the research cities with our own blind spots from design. And we had to ask ourselves the question, like, what was it that we uniquely brought to the exhibition of all of this work? Um, so we, uh, we looked at the set of representational or cartographic practices within design and within the adjacent field of geography, specifically how space is spoken of in geography, um, that pointed most readily to open interpretations, uh, those kind of forms of representation that engaged multiple processes and meanings of a site. Um, here I'm showing, uh, I'm sure a number of you know this, but here I'm showing an old Diller and Scafidio uh, mapping of Normandy from their 1994 project, Back to the Front. Um, David Harvey, uh, the, the geographer, uh, has um, in his, his paper, Space is a Keyword, gives us uh, the, the term relational space, which seemed uh, especially apt for the project that we, we were developing. And for Harvey, the relational view of space holds that there is no such thing as a space outside of the processes that define it. And we were hoping that the application of this definition to urban space is somewhat self-evident and that we could move on to sort of cartographic and um, sort of data-driven uh, visualizations of cities with this idea of kind of relational space in mind. Um, to continue with Harvey, um, quote, an event or a thing at a point in space cannot be understood by appeal to what exists only at that point. It depends upon a wide variety of disparate influences swirling over space in the past, present, and future and uh, concentrating and congealing at a certain point to define the nature of that point. Okay? There are certain topics, such as the political role of collective memories in urban processes, that can only be approached this way. And Harvey says that he could not box political or collective memories in some absolute space um, and clearly situate them on the map. He asked himself the question, what does Tiananmen Square or Ground Zero mean? to which his answer was that he could only seek an answer uh, in relational terms. And though he's not speaking about representation in sort of a more conventional material sense that we would think of within architecture and the larger design disciplines, this idea of processes defining what a site was was especially inspiring for us. Um, in response to those words, though, we might ask, how do we draw this? And um, 
a sort of canonical text and mapping, James Corner's Agency of Mapping uh, from 1999, contains a line of thought similar to Harvey's relational space that we drew upon. And um, I feel like maybe there's a bit of nostalgia embedded in my presentation here because I'm showing uh, mid-90s Dylan Scafidio uh, renderings while talking about James Corner's Agency of Mapping. So perhaps I'm, I'm just uh, early to the party of the next wave of nostalgia in the design disciplines. Maybe the mid-90s will be back soon. But uh, working from Corner's uh, paper, he says that there's an infinitely open rhizomatic nature of mapping, as opposed to mere tracing, that affords many diverse entryways, exits, and lines of flight, each of which allows for a plural, plural ugh, many, many readings, uh, <laughs> uses and effects. So mapping, in this relational way, structures an open-ended series of relationships that must remain open. So through the, um, the resultant work, um, we produced a series of what appear to be cartographic collages. The logic of collage, or of simply combining fragments, was not our goal. Again, following the language of, of Corner, we were after a more systematic montage where multiple and independent layers are incorporated as a synthetic composite and that the resultant maps might not represent any one thing at all, and we're hopefully open to multiple interpretations, and specifically multiple interpretations from dis uh, different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, to return to the Diller and Scafidio image that I have here, um, I actually feel this is a pretty great precedent um, for some of the ideas that uh, we are hoping to address in the animations that you're going to see soon. Um, in this project, they're sort of arguing that the beaches of Normandy are reaffirmed and re reproduced over time through a series of events. The first uh, militaristic campaign with all of the representations that go along with that. Uh, the second sort of cinematic representations that attempt to restage the events on the beach of Normandy uh, during D-Day. And then lastly, the touristic version of the site. Um, where a tourist, uh, tourist visit Normandy with an obsession for the first, where the first boot of an American soldier hit the ground, where the first beachhead was established. And that through all of these kind of different uh, ways of approaching this site, um, that Normandy as a place evolves over time. It has multiple meanings and there's multiple types of representational media that goes along with that. Um, so with that in mind, we started to produce a series of overlays um, that will become animated and start to build up sort of spatial narratives around each of the cities that I mentioned above. So um, we'll be looking at some of these in more detail in just a moment. As I mentioned before, there were four cities uh, used to structure um, the Mellon project. Um, these were Berlin, Boston, Istanbul, and Mumbai. And for the uh, exhibition, we developed uh, three of these sort of large relational space animated cartographic representations. We didn't come up with a buzzword for it, so that's, that's all one word with hyphens in between it. Maybe it should be in German. Um, but there we had three narratives for each of the cities. And um, uh, along with each narrative, hmm? oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, I'm happy to step back if I'm, if I'm going through this a little too quickly. Okay. Um, around each of the narratives, there was a sort of uh, structure to this where uh, each portal had a research director um, and then a series of students that I sort of coordinated in order to, to produce, um, help them produce these cartographic narratives. Um, as I mentioned before, Eve and I were um, the ones sort of credited as uh, co-curators, um, but it was part of that much larger team that I showed earlier, um, and also with the collaboration of Howler Yoon Architecture for the development of the actual physical pieces you'll see in the exhibition, and then working closely with one of our uh, recent graduates, Scott Smith, on the production of, of the animated content. Okay, so I'm going to focus on Berlin, and uh, I realize this is perhaps uh, contradictory um, with what I said uh, earlier about open, open interpretation, I'm actually going to just step us through one of the narratives and tell you what, <laughs> what we were intending with it, but um, hopefully still um, you could see the potential for reading it in multiple ways from different disciplines. Okay, so um, working with a, a, a huge repository um, of archival ma material on the city, we geo-referenced a bunch of uh, information together in order to build up um, a story about the plans, 
that were uh, combined in order to produce uh, the, the fabric of Berlin that we see in the mid-1800s, while also acknowledging the numerous plans that were never adopted. So um, in the kind of plans that we associate with Berlin as it actually existed, there were uh, several other plans um, at all points in time that were discarded. Um, so other possible futures that uh, show up in the books and can be sort of spatialized against the city as it's coming together, but then, um, then disappear quite literally from the map. Um, for this narrative, we specifically uh, looked at the Luisenstadt neighborhood and how that became a prototype, um, or what the team called an experimental ground, uh, that went on to inform the rest of the, uh, the structure of Berlin through the idea of the Berlin block. Okay, so here we're working with um, archival material um, that show illustrations and landscape drawings of the Kreuzberg Hill, uh, which ultimately became the site of the early Luisenstadt Canal, and it's through the canal that much of the um, uh, city building in the mid-1800s occurred. So we're going to see the canal here. Okay, the canal was developed um, uh, specifically to give access to extraction sites that were far outside of the city, so the materials for building the blocks and the various factories in Luisenstadt could be established. We see here that um, early, uh, early mechanical techniques of dredging um, were challenged by local workers, and there was a series of riots around it and a series of protests. Of course, all of this history gets um, uh, sort of a race from the standard forms of representation that designers use in order to talk about this, the history of, of uh, urban form developing in the area. And this ultimately is the figure of the canal. And those of you who know Berlin will, will know this figure. It's now a park. The, the canal is no longer present in that way. Now, the canal produced a particular scale of, um, of blocks around it, where there was an old block typology and a new block typology. And combining these with um, the sort of historical codes and, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the building codes of the mid-1800s, we highlighted the way that uh, the building footprints used in the blocks used to populate the old block, but however, in the new block form in the Luisenstadt area, there became this new evacuated center and that's crucial um, for how this area developed in terms of uh, industry, because the interior of that block um, was undefined, it was unzoned, and was left open to a lot of um, improvisational um, programs being embedded within it. So to pick up some of the language earlier, and we're going to see that in a second. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here. So within, within the blocks, we had schools and schoolyards started to emerge. Um, there was military activity, so they would do trainings, uh, training procedures there. Um, and then uh, types of uh, industries started to emerge. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Where first, um, a nascent toy industry showed up in the interiors of the blocks. And it became a large uh, export district for Berlin. Now, after the toys, there was a series of, of innovations in aviation that showed up. I'm going to let this play out for a second. Okay, so this develops in aviation ultimately resulted in the building of parts um, 
for the, the German Air Force and military planes, and then ultimately uh, the armament industry. So munitions were starting to be, factories for munitions were established in the interiors of this block. So here we can see um, from the development of the canal and a particular block size, uh, it created the footprint within which a series of informal industries could get plugged in, into, the, into the plan of Germany. Now, um, this informs the Hobrecht plan of 1862, which is often discussed as sort of the, the, uh, the, the beginning of the modern plan for Berlin. Um, and yet the sort of precursors to the Hobrecht plan, um, according to, to Eve and her research, those, those precursors are not, not really discussed. And that the, the role that Luisenstadt played um, as kind of the template that gets rolled out, the test site or the test bed um, uh, for the rest of the city. Now, given these informal industries that show up in the bloc, uh, during World War II, the, uh, the Allies uh, bombed this area pretty heavily because they wanted to uh, disrupt the industry that, that re uh, resulted in the, um, in the creation of airplanes and munitions. Now, working with a series of historical maps um, of building footprints, uh, we could, uh, and aerial imagery, we could construct um, a composite map that showed this, the before and after um, of the city, actually highlighting the, uh, the building footprints that were left after the bombing. And so we can see large swaths of area um, that have been removed from the city here. And then Luisenstadt actually um, uh, contains part of the border uh, between the Allies and the Russian, the Russian sector uh, in the post-war era. Now, there were a series of plans uh, for the redevelopment of the area, um, but then the, uh, the Berlin Wall cut directly through this section. And here we composited together uh, numerous media types uh, that looked specifically at the Luisenstadt area. Um, and how it showed up in, in movies and in photographs at the time. Now I'm going to skip ahead a little uh, quickly through some of this because I am at the end of my time here. Um, what's interesting about the next era is that um, after the, the wall cuts through the neighborhood, there's a number of urban proposals um, for redeveloping the area. And we notice that uh, proposals that come from the West, um, they imagine the wall as something that's always going to be present. So even though these were urban plans that were supposed to project 30, 40, 50 years into the future of Berlin, the wall itself is taken as a given. Um, with these plans kind of in mind, there was a, a large amount of demolition that happened uh, through the 70s. And to run counter to this demolition, uh, there was a very active culture of squatting and uh, artist communities that located um, themselves here. And they were able to push back um, on the demolition. And they created a series of counter maps or maps about where uh, their squats were and the territory that they were claiming in Berlin um, against the desire to, to knock most of it down out of um, the interest of these large scale urban plans. Now, the squatters uh, end up rehabilitating a number of the blocks. And um, we can see here, we're coming to the map in one second. What's sort of crucial about this is that in their rehabilitation, they prepare the ground for a later stage of um, uh, real estate speculation, where the parts of the neighborhood that they specifically redevelop on their own behalf become the sites the developers uh, want to redevelop along um, uh, along mean, uh, the means of producing uh, profit. So we, here we'll see their maps, and then we reference this against uh, a map of all the buildings that had been rehabilitated by, by developers rather than squatters. Okay, so there's their space. Excuse me.
and then those are the buildings that were ultimately redeveloped by, um, by other developers, not the squatters in the community. Okay, so now um, this part of town has become sort of a center for branding of what the next wave of Berlin should be from the um, standpoint of economic development um, and real estate development. And given that, the way that um, the site has evolved, we thought this kind of collage of media would show the sort of various moments of contention or the contingencies that kind of came together in order to produce this one small section of the city and how that became sort of taken up at different moments, one through the Hobrick plan to produce a larger scale block fabric in Berlin, but then also now in the contemporary moment through all of these representations of sort of um, development literature um, that Luisenstadt or Kreuzberg um, uh, has become sort of the model for where they think the sort of future of what they're calling sort of safe or cautious development. Um, so we developed a number of narratives in this way for all of the cities that try to pull together the media to tell, um, to tell the stories in this way that show sort of competing voices and multiple processes at work in order to kind of uncover um, uh, a different history of the present for each of these blocks. There's a, a bit more here, but I, I've gone over, so, um, so thank you very much. Hi, afternoon everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, for Laura, for the invitation. I'm really happy to join you here at um, Columbia University. Um, I've been at GSAP before as a visiting critic in Mario Gooden's Global Africa Lab um, classes, and it's wonderful to present amongst um, all the other wonderful uh, speakers um, and just share my ideas, and I hope there'll be wonderful conversation um, between us after this. Um, I have some navigating um, online to do, so I'm just pulling out the um, mouse and the keypad here, and um, I'm watching my time, and you'll see um, the, my timekeeping mechanism later on. Um, so here we are. Um, I'm looking at you, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, my, it's interesting uh, to uh, think about Wendy's uh, talk. Um, thinking about uh, likeness and uh, sort of moving together or running, fleeing a place uh, to uh, um, try to stay with kin. Um, I find myself uh, in the United States. I came here to study um, and leaving home brought me uh, to desire to find my kinfolk, to find spaces where I could see myself reflected um, and in a way, a lot of my work is to do with this. It's biographical. It's about mapping space. It's about locating spaces um, where I um, can see a, a repetition, a restaging, a redrawing of spaces uh, like those I find at home. Um, but the goal is not to disappear in these spaces. Um, and the people that I find in these spaces are not exactly like me. We don't have uh, identical backgrounds. We don't look exactly the same. Uh, we don't have the exact same names. Um, but there is a way that there is some blending where some of the edges do fall into each other, um, where there are connections. Um, there are also clear uh, distinctions and nuances uh, that uh, talk about difference. Um, and those things play out uh, in transactions. Um, and so this, uh, these images here are from an excerpt from a video piece I did with Diani Duz, a, a sound artist, um, and the piece is called Pain Revisited. Um, the audio at the beginning of this piece is taken from um, her time in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, on study abroad. She was a student at NYU, and there's a girls' hostel doing initiation uh, for the young women there, and they're learning to chant um, these slogans uh, that are, are sort of around uh, the identity of their hostel. Um, I really uh, love to think about these spaces which are full of women, where women's voices um, are really, uh, can really resonate out, ring out, where women are teaching each other, sharing, where uh, there's this, this repetition builds and builds and builds. Um, it's also interesting to think about um, accumulation and uh, 
oneness, unity, um, also accumulation um, and sort of density. Um, a lot of my work um, is dealing with this idea um, of an inside and outsider conversation. So I'm going into these spaces like African hair braiding salons um, in New York City um, and London, other spaces that I visit, um, and knowing uh, full well that there are people that will uh, that identify with these spaces um, and other people that just walk past them. Um, Here's me looking uh, back at you again, uh, more, uh, you know, with a kind of a side eye. The, the outside, uh, inside um, idea is very important uh, to me. I'm interested in different layers of legibility. Um, I'm interested in what you hear from the accumulated voices, um, how they appear as one singular um, uh, image, uh, you know, oftentimes to people, um, and who who is able to read the edges um, of the space, the edges of individuals, uh, the edges of the different cultures represented. Um, I'm also interested in myself as a player um, within the um, within what's happening uh, in front of me in in the spaces that I uh, move through. And I'll just read a few notes uh, here. I'm not going to read much, but just a few notes that I'd written to sort of frame some of uh, what I'm talking about. So moving through the world, across geographic boundaries, negotiating my person between cultures, I become increasingly aware of the effect that space has on my identity. My appearance seems to be tied to a range of ideas depending on where I stand. Appearance, the way that someone uh, or something looks so like her disheveled appearance, or um, appearance, an act of performing or participating in a public event. Um, I love this uh, map, it wasn't intentional to cut out the rest of the world, <laughs> but um, it's what I had on my uh, machine. I was thinking about um, how to present the next project, uh, which uh, takes me into another space of Africa. Um, it's quite interesting to think about um, how my work has evolved, uh, leaving uh, Zimbabwe to come to study in the United States, uh, going to the United Kingdom to visit family, and uh, discovering uh, how all these African hair braiding salons, African food stores existed, leading me uh, to try to find where all these motifs keep being replicated, these signs of diaspora. Um, and traveling back and forth uh, on the continent, uh, mostly between Zimbabwe and South Africa, Zimbabwe is this tiny teapot country here, if you don't know it, which is uh, no longer ruled by Robert Mugabe. Um, and uh, this is South Africa, um, where the, the next uh, project takes place. Um, but I have Cameroon highlighted here because I was quite fascinated uh, to see this idea of diaspora still uh, f uh, forming within uh, other, other geographies, not just thinking about Africans abroad, which most of my work points to, but Africans within Africa, Africans from different nations uh, finding each other within these spaces and oftentimes within the space of the African hair braiding salon. So here on the map we have highlighted Cameroon um, and Kenya. Um, and the location of the work um, is here in South Africa. Um, I just put this slide in just to think about that flattening um, space, but um, here I wanted to talk a little bit more about something that you find uh, almost anywhere that a black woman has moved through. Uh, this piece of tumbleweave, so important um, in identifying um, who has been in that space. Uh, for me, it's, it's a way to think about uh, black women claiming space, leaving something behind. It's never intentional. It happens accidentally. Um, and you want to make sure that, you want to distance yourself from this tumbleweave as soon as possible, that it didn't drop out from your own head. Um, but still, nonetheless, for me, it's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of presence. It's a trace. Um, and it's tracing back uh, also to an identity, to a space, or to a number of spaces. Um, I also like the idea of tumbleweave um, as a sticky medium. You know, when we're designing websites, um, you think about how to make a website sticky, how to uh, hold people uh, in that space, um, as uh, I guess some people in here would consider themselves digital natives, um, as we are moving through the internet on mobile devices, on um, laptops, uh, desktops, uh, we're often clicking uh, onto things, sometimes by mistake, sometimes intentionally. Um, and as an artist who's interested in working 
uh, online, how can I uh, make my audience invested um, in staying in these spaces? Um, I'm trying to make work that, is, that I think is interesting. I'm trying to make work uh, that I want to share. Um, I'm accumulating all of this uh, content and documenting, but how do I make sure that it is something that people want to spend uh, time with and engage with? Um, so this piece uh, is called Morning All, and it's a greeting uh, that um, Mama, who owns this uh, African hair braiding salon in Yeovil, Yo Johannesburg, um, says to somebody passing by her salon, Morning All, and the other person just says morning. Um, and we, uh, me and my friend who takes me to the salon, Mili Sutando, jokingly uh, echo what she's saying, morning all, sort of mimicking her in loving jest. Um, and Mama goes on uh, to tell us that she has to say morning or It's a way, um, you know, it's just much more endearing. It's not just about saying morning. It's about saying, how are you doing? Is everyone well? Are you well? If she just says morning, it's too European. It means I don't want, I don't have time for you. You go your way, I go my own way. Um, thinking about diaspora, thinking about place, thinking about holding you in the space, but also embedding other things uh, within this project, uh, mapping the time I spent uh, in the salon. Um, as I'm working, as I'm accumulating and documenting, um, I'm thinking about time and I'm thinking about labor. Um, as an artist, you know, those things are tied to the practice. Um, and so how can I get the audience member, uh, who sometimes myself, uh, sometimes people that I know, uh, sometimes you right now, how can I get you to invest uh, in uh, the work and also to understand other aspects? Um, the idea of braiding is, you know, really, um, it's adornment, it's aesthetics, sometimes it's functional. Um, but when you are not getting your hair braided, you are, so, you are really on the outside. When you have gotten your hair braided, you understand that this investment of time, you understand the amount of technical skill it takes uh, to be able to produce this work. Um, and so uh, Morning Wall is an attempt to, uh, to map all of these uh, elements onto the work. Um, the project takes three hours uh, to fully um, uh, consume. Um, it runs uh, for the duration of my hair braiding appointment, and is a, it's, in, it's a transcript of the conversations that I, my, uh, that I have with Melissa Tando and um, Mama, who owns the salon and is also braiding my hair. Um, as you uh, comb through the website, you can see who is speaking. Um, thinking again about this insider-outsider relationship, as you're walking through uh, past a salon, as you are uh, looking at people, how do they appear? Are they a flattened group? Do they have specific identities? And what is your investment in taking time to find out more about the complexity of the, of, uh, the individuals in the space? Um, you do have some options, just like a customer in the African hair braiding salon, to be able to change the style, uh, to choose the style that you want. Um, and the beginning of uh, this conversation um, is all about that. Um, so, I, so something like this. I don't want it to meet at the back there. I want it to keep going up like that. So just up like this, coming up on the sides. Or then also thinking maybe it can, maybe, let me, let me draw another head. You know, I'm sketching this hairstyle for her. Um, it could go up, 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 and then it's just free. That's free? That's free? Ah, yeah. So it can go from side up, 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 and then this is just free, and then this one will be by the side. This one comes here like this, yeah. But we can also, but we can also, we don't have to do it like that. We can just do it like this, and we can do it like that. Which one do you think is better? Um, we go on to talk about how I enjoy wearing head wraps, if I want to have extensions, um, and you know, there's a long, long process um, going on here. Some other things that are mapped onto uh, the hair braiding salon, or the act of braiding, is a gene genealogy of ideas, where those styles come from. Um, in our conversation, Melissa Tando was talking to Mama um, about the last hairstyle she had, which is based on a JD or JK photograph, a phenomenal Nigerian um, 
photographer who was, has now passed away. Um, and so thinking about art um, being replicated or traditional culture being replicated, um, the, the space of the African hair braiding salon for me is similar to my uh, design studio uh, where there's a client, uh, there is somebody uh, that is a practitioner and can respond to a prompt um, and can also iterate and, um, yeah, and, and create their own um, interpretation. Uh, some of my favorite uh, moments on this website are these where you have big blocks um, of pattern. There's actually about five or ten minutes um, with just uh, pattern. Um, and these are moments where either there is, um, there, I mean, there is talking happening uh, in the salon. You know, it's not just us in there. And um, it is moments where either myself, Mama, and... Um, and uh, Melissa Sutando are not speaking to each other, but there are gentlemen in the background from Nigeria, the Baba is Nigerian in the space, um, are talking about issues that I did not want to include in the transcript uh, because it has to do with um, this insider-outsider negotiation, who is an immigrant, what are they doing to be able to be in the space of South Africa, um, and thinking about the audience that I have on the internet, um, I wanted to uh, protect that. So in a way, this uh, project is, like, is like trying to acknowledge the different audiences and trying to censor and uh, protect uh, some of the content that, it, that is there. There is content, it's visual, it is graphic, it is complex, um, but it's not spelled out for you. Um, just before I move on to the next project, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of this, uh, producing this work. It's documenting um, my uh, experience moving through Johannesburg, through Yeovil, a space where there are many, um, where there are many immigrants living. Um, it's an audio recording, um, which I often start, which I often do because of what uh, it means uh, for me to go into these spaces and photograph them and then reproduce uh, those bodies um, in spaces outside of uh, home. I, I feel there's some politics around that that I'm, I'm not comfortable with. And so this act of, of documenting audio, um, editing, um, you know, transcribing and then editing uh, is always a very tricky process. How do I um, write this, uh, how do I present this work uh, when there are multiple audiences who might not understand uh, the syntax uh, or what, uh, how to translate certain um, enunciations that occur? I can just see here this um, comment that's like, eh, yes, or when we say, uh, uh or when someone says, yeah, but it reads as yeah. You know, there's a lot of <laughs> things that I cannot map onto um, uh, the space. And thinking about mapping um, as something that's visual, but taking from uh, what we hear, um, I'm still trying to uh, deal with uh, what is lost in translation. Um, and I think I will uh, move on, move past this one, and talk about another project. Um, before I forget, I did bring up Kenya earlier. The assistant who's helping Mama braid my hair is from Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, during this conversation, she talks about herself moving from uh, Kenya to live in Durban, South Africa, and why she moved um, to Johannesburg. So all the way through the conversation, we're all negotiating uh, the continent. We're all talking about our experience moving through um, and the opening is um, Mama asking Mili Sutando, when are you coming to um, Cameroon? Um, so thinking about uh, visiting each other and uh, talking about all the different spaces that we've moved through um, in the content you call home. Um, another project um, more directly uh, about Zimbabwe, uh, readingzimbabwe.com, very simple uh, title, uh, began uh, when I moved to New York City um, last, well, two summers ago um, when I uh, met a colleague, Tinashe Mushakavanu, who is an author and literary critic. Um, he's also an academic. And uh, we were sitting with a community of ours uh, in bed and talking about Zimbabwean literature, which all of us besides Tinashe knew you know, almost nothing about. Um, we had been so separated from um, all these ideas that people had been writing about, from ideas that um, authors from Zimbabwe um, had penned, um, not 
because we moved abroad, but because of what education does. Um, education is a, a series um, of, uh, is a system of, it's a system of knowledge uh, that is presented to a community. Um, and you can decide to point to certain locations, you can locate certain ideas, or you can leave them out. You can um, help people to find their way, or you can dictate a route. Um, and education in Zimbabwe, for the most part, is a dictated route. It's a very strict um, genealogy of ideas. Many of those ideas not coming from, um, are not homegrown. Uh, we're reading books that are written uh, by Europeans, mostly uh, British uh, authors. Um, part of it has to do with uh, colonial um, heritage. Um, and I won't talk about <laughs> other reasons. Um, so Reading Zimbabwe uh, became uh, our passion project to try to discover more about what has been written about Zimbabwe. Um, it became a sort of journey back to ourselves, a way to try to see what the landscape looked like in terms of information, creative writing, commentary um, about a nation, a very a big nation, um, but with only one story for the past 37 years. Um, when I you know, came to the United States and mentioned that I was Zimbabwean, the first thing people would say to me is like, oh, Robert Mugabe. Um, and so how do you uh, talk about the beauty of a space with so many conflicting identities, with so many um, different uh, moments in time, so many interesting uh, histories? Um, we just decided to start wherever we could. Um, Reading Zimbabwe, as you saw at the beginning, has over 1,600 titles listed on it. Um, all of these titles are input by hand by Tinashe. It's our personal sort of uh, fact-finding mission, um, but this has to change. Uh, Reading Zimbabwe needs to be a people's library. It needs to be a repository that other people can um, add to uh, we can't find everything, um, and uh, we want to open this up uh, to more collaborative, uh, to, to be a more collaborative repository. Um, we're not just charting books, but we're also thinking about who's been writing. Um, and if you see here, there are 999 authors listed so far um, from 114 cities. So. Um, this means that Zimbabwe is being documented by many, many people, not just Zimbabweans. Oftentimes when we talk about this project, people think it's very provincial. They think the audience is just for Zimbabwe. But this project is teaching us that there are many people that are interested in Zimbabwe for different reasons. Um, so we have all our books listed here. Um, and again, with my practice thinking about um, this idea of codified languages, insider-outsider patterns, uh, there are some things that are just uh, Tinashe and I's uh, decisions. Uh, so you know, some of these symbols, how we're organizing uh, the books uh, according to some broader themes. Um, but we do uh, give the audience um, some, cat some other categories, uh, sort of sub-categories, to uh, be able to choose uh, publications from. Um, we're not uh, adding an editorial to this content yet. We just want to put out as much information um, as we can and allow people to have access uh, to this. But with that information also comes gaps. Um, we had a battle at the beginning of this project thinking about uh, what to do with books that did not have covers. Um, but for me, some of these absences are what makes the project beautiful. Um, the fact that we can't find everything um, is part of the story. Um, we do not have the, the cover image because the book is out of print. This is part of the story. This is part of the story of knowledge production around um, Zimbabwe. Um, many of the books that have been uh, produced are not uh, being uh, printed again. Many of them are not in circulation in Zimbabwe. Uh, many of the books have been banned in Zimbabwe. Um, and so this project is trying to uh, give point people to a way to locate um, that there is information about us out there, that our story is much larger, um, and that individuals can, have, can make their own way, make their own independent routes uh, through what uh, is interesting or important for them to locate about their identity as Zimbabweans or a broader community who wants to learn from our story. Um, I'm just going to go out of here quickly. Keep clicking the thing. Um, 
when we think about Zimbabwe, um, there is, uh, the name is coming from Great Zimbabwe. It's an 11th century uh, kingdom based in the southeast of uh, Mashingo. And our project um, is really uh, thinking about this space. It's a space that uh, was, had its, uh, you know, was at its height of during the 11th, 12th century um, and now uh, is in ruins. It's in ruins because, uh, not because of lack of care, but because of uh, archaeologists going in to excavate to look uh, for references of how this place was made. Uh, Great Zimbabwe is, um, is a structure that is built uh, just brick upon brick with no mortar at all. The walls are circular and there's uh, some conical towers that would um, be in the, in the cent more central uh, enclaves for important um, rule, so, so different people in the, in the hierarchy of uh, the leadership. Um, but now is uh, mainly only the great enclosure and just a lot of, uh, you can see the traces of what should be there, but what we don't have access to, we, we have to really imagine. Um, so we are trying to fill those gaps, and um, I'm hoping that we'll have more conversations with people um, about how to continue to build this repository, how to think about mapping um, the different um, aspects of knowledge uh, together, how can we link um, ideas of when books were produced uh, to what is happening in the country, um, for instance, uh, we do have data uh, which uh, tells you when uh, books were uh, produced. We can uh, tell you uh, where the books were produced, um, at, but we also think about how people are visually thinking about Zimbabwe as these books are being printed, the motifs uh, that are on the uh, publications, what is an idea, how does an idea of a nation get flattened into graphics. Um, yeah, thank you. Everyone. I too sometimes contribute to the um, tumbleweave a hashtag on Instagram, so I do find it quite fun. Um, I just bought these at the dollar store last week. It's my first time using them at a podium, so hopefully it works. <laughs> so thank you to the organizers. They already don't work. They're all foggy. <laughs> to the organizers, <laughs> sorry, uh, Lauren, and especially Dare for all of the work that you did to organize and to get me um, here today. Um, my talk today is a bit of a departure of sorts, but one to get us think about the role of creative text when it comes to uh, deliberate acts of disruption in city spaces. Or perhaps to, to riff off of Wendy's uh, question, are who are our neighbors? So this is for Nas, Malik, Brittany, and Alex. If you're here with the NYPD or you're with the FBI, welcome, sincerely. We expect you here. That was the brief greeting spoken by an imam at the beginning of a prayer gathering depicted in the 2015 film Nas and Malik. This welcoming to the mosque is a recognition of and perhaps a reckoning with the seeming inevitability of police surveillance and monitoring of Muslim communities by way of, for example, the NYPD's now disbanded demographic unit, sometimes by infiltration of mosques and Muslim student groups by plainclothes cops, or through the work of FBI informants, or by way of create and capture. Of course, the surveillance of Muslims in the United States is not a recent formation. It occurred long before the current president, then candidate, proclaimed, quote, I want surveillance of certain mosques, okay? And you know what? We've had it before and we'll have it again, end quote. One need only look at the thousands of pages of declassified FBI documents on Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, and the Nation of Islam that disclose, by way of redaction and non-disclosure, the extent of the state's targeted actions. In the film Nas and Malik, Malik and Nas, two black queer Muslim teenagers move in and around Brooklyn by foot, by train, by bike, all in the course of one day. Their conversations throughout the day range, skimming talk, topics such as the gentrification of Brooklyn, the Quran, bystander intervention, prisons, and profiling at airports. At one point, they're approached by a white, greasy-haired, undercover uh, NYPD cop who attempts to entrap the, the two into buying a gun. Unsuccessful, 
the undercover cop reports the teenagers to an FBI agent sitting in a black sedan. This is the making of Create and Capture. The making of informants where, allegedly, the FBI goes to length to outfit its targets with terrorist starter kits in order to manufacture and then foil terrorist plots. Malik and Nas sell various things, like Catholic saint cards, lottery cards, and perfume oil along Fulton Avenue, to, Fulton Street, sorry, <laughs> to raise some cash. But it's their loving on each other cautiously in public that makes them illegible to the FBI. Their acts of loving on each other while moving through the city, like on the L train, are cautious because of homo antagonistic surveillance by family, school, and the public. This illegibility then renders them only legible as all the more suspicious to the FBI agent in the black sedan. I want to hold on to the Maliks and the Nazes, than the Nazes, but not Nas and Malik the film, for how they allow me to begin to think with what Sylvia Winter calls the practice of decipherment in her essay, Rethinking Aesthetics, Notes Towards a Deciphering Practice. In this essay, Winter suggests that a deciphering practice seeks to identify not what texts and their signifying practices can be interpreted to mean, but what they can be deciphered to do. A deciphering practice is a way of getting at, as Ronaldo Walcott puts it in his discussion of that same essay, a reconstituted uni universalism proffered from the vantage point of the sub subaltern and the dispossessed. Therefore, a deciphering practice moves towards making alterable our current epistemological order, rather than merely being about film or media criticism, uh, media criticism that is enfolded into, as Winter puts it, the instituting of the figure of man and its related middle class subject. Black queer love in public makes possible an anti-colonial reading of the Malik's and the Nazis in the time of, for example, ongoing stops and frisks, the black site for police torture that, is, that was Chicago's Hammam Square, the FBI's proposed shared responsibility committees, the FBI's Don't Be a Puppet website, and the Department of Homeland Security's monitoring of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I'm thinking here also of um, the recent, in, in terms of like epistemic violence and the, the ways in which violence can be um, enacted by way of knowledge production. Uh, just earlier this week, the, AC, the Boston ACLU uh, released a report. Um, they, they had gotten this information through a FOIA request that the Boston Police Department had uh, contracted with Geofedia to do um, data mining analytics on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media sites for keywords such as, or terms such as Black Lives Matter, Mike Brown, Ferguson, protest, M Muslim Lives Matter. So with this frame, I want to turn to first the leaked, unclassified, for official use only, FBI intelligent assessment, black identity extremists likely motivates target law enforcement offers, and then briefly to the documentary, Who Streets, for guideposts that this film offers us for anti-colonial action. In this way, um, what follows is not a paper on the U.S. surveillance policies with regard to the war on terror or on state and state sanctioned violences against everyday black life. Instead, by foregrounding the film Nas and Malik for the sake of the Maliks and the Nazes over the film itself, and by asking what this text can be deciphered to do, what I'm suggesting is that the love of black people is a liberatory practice and a strategy for conf confronting the gendered violences of anti-black police terror. This claim is obvious and not revelatory. For example, Black Lives Matter Toronto's list of demands and their queer positive freedom school educational programs for children crafted through a trans feminist lens, or the Movement for Black Lives platform statement where they say that we are intentional about amplifying particular experience of state, of state and gendered violence that black, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming women and intersex people face. By calling attention to loving black people as a liberatory process, practice, it is to say that it's a, del a deliberate enactment of anti-colonial politics against the colonial system and all of its makings, white supremacy, capitalist exploitation, white settler state logics of indigenous dispossession, and bureaucratic disavowal, anti-black terrorism, heteropatriarchal violence. Decolonial de transformations can be fleeting sometimes. They morph and mutate. They can become reincorporated or structurally adjusted, so to speak, into new systems of violence. 
So I use the term anti-colonial here intentionally, as doing so calls attention to the continuous groundwork and deliberate acts of disruption necessary to hold the world that we want to someday get at to its promise of liberation, a world that is something other than this colonial one. <clears throat> Prepared by the FBI's domestic terrorism unit uh, in August 2016, the leaked intelligent assessment brings with it the creation of a new, classified, a new classification, black identity extremists, which the FBI defines as, in a rather incomplete and confounding and probably deliberate uh, fashion, as, quote, individuals who seek wholly or in part through unlawful acts of force or violence in response to perceived racism and injustice in American society, and some do so in furtherance of establishing a black homeland or autonomous black social institutions, communities, or governing organizations within the United States. This document uh, cites the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in August 2014, and that grand jury's non-indictment of the cop who killed him as the very likely impetus for the rise of this new classification. This new classification is now part of the FBI's catalog of surveillance of black life and the criminalization of black political struggle. According to the leaked document, and this is a quote, the FBI assesses that it's very likely that the black identity extremist perception of unjust treatment of African Amer Americans and the perceived unchallenged illegitimate actions of law enforcement will inspire premeditated, sorry, premeditated attacks against law enforcement over the next year. This may also lead to an increase in black identity extremist group memberships, collaboration among black identity extremist groups, or the appearance of additional violent lone offenders motivated by black identity extremist rhetoric or rhetoric. The FBI further assesses it is very likely additional controversial police shootings of African Americans and the associated legal proceedings will continue to serve as drivers for violence against law enforcement. So this leaked FBI documents continues to note and by noting that the desire for physical or psychological separation is typically based on either a religious or political belief system, which is sometimes formed around or includes a belief in racial superior superiority or supremacy. Interestingly, this leaked document makes no reference to the alt-right movement or any other nomenclature that names white supremacists and white nationalist groups, organizations, or ideologies and their calls for an establishment of a white ethnostate. So I cite from this leaked document at length here because it's an instrument of the FBI's power to index certain black political struggle as, in, as an internal threat to the national security, where this indexing becomes the state's alibi and its justification for repression of any critique or responses coming from black people when it comes to state violence against black people and their communities. So this leaked 12-page threat assessment is then the documentary evidence of the sources and methods of the state's anti-black surveillance rationalities. For example, the document states that the FBI only uses likelihood expressions and does not derive judgments via statistical analysis, and instead what is claimed to be presented are analytical judgments. However, these analytical judgment, judgments, and they go like this, the FBI assesses that, and it's very likely, and when it comes to perceptions of unjust treatment. So these analytical judgments work to produce that very statistical analysis where very likely is equated with highly probable at a rate of 80 to 95%. It's a spurious uh, correlation indeed, but if we were to take such uh, certainty at face value for a moment, then we must read into the use of the future tense, will come to serve, or sorry, will continue to serve, as in will continue to serve as the drivers for violence against law enforcement in the excerpt that I read just a while ago, as an intentional admission, or perhaps an, an unintentional admission, that the police shootings of black people will continue along with the non-indictments, acquittals, or in the case of the now former cop who killed Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2016, all charges removed from record. The rhetoric of statistics as objective, empirical truth, when they are in fact not, employed in this leaked threat assessment, can be deciphered to be part of the parcel of the methods in the FBI's intelligent sources and methods that work to name black political struggle as an ideological and statistically verifiable threat to police power. Nowhere in the threat assessment are any credible specifics around future violent acts targeted at police. Instead, it only offers the black identity extremist as, as a category manufactured to trigger 
one could guess, the Bureau's counterintelligence tools, such as the recruiting of informants and its other methods of disruption and discrediting. In whose streets, Brittany Farrell, co-founder of the St. Louis-based Millennial Activists United, calls for a different future tense, one that centers a black queer critique of our current governing order. This 2017 documentary follows Brittany Farrell and her partner Alexis Templeton throughout their activist work or caretaking during the Ferguson uprising and beyond. A highway shutdown, their wedding, movement work within the city, community meetings with elected officials, Ferguson October, protests, disrupting acts, and, dis and loving acts. Millennium Activists United is a grassroots organization created by black queer women. Their way of caring demonstrates that black queer revolutionary love can make possible by showing what it looks like to love black people in public spaces, like their shutdown of the I-70 highway, where one motorist violently drove through um, their protesters' human barricade. This love is strategic and it's dutiful, as they echo Ashada Shakur throughout the documentary. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our change. At one point during the documentary, Brittany Farrell outlines a, a method for a deciphering practice when she says, I just challenge these ideas of normality. If your normal is limited opportunities for people of color, why aren't you questioning that normal? If that normal is an 18-year-old teenager laying in the street for four hours, but that's your normal, right? Everybody wants things to be normal. I feel like if you are not questioning normal, you're not paying attention. We can take from Brittany Farrell's quote that if you're not questioning colonial forms of domination, then you are willfully not paying attention. Although Sylvia Winter's essay on deciphering practice is focused on texts like film that shape imaginaries of our current governing order, we can still look to it as a means of getting at a way of reading our presence in the making of our anti-colonial futures in city spaces and elsewhere. Or as Brittany Farrell aptly put it, it's that feeling that keeps me going. So if we don't hold on to that feeling, this deciphering practice, we remain, as Winter puts it, accomplices in the epistemic contract. And she warns that function not in the name of liberation, but in re replicating our current governing order. Thank you. So thank you, thank you all for these really phenomenal papers. And I think there's lots to talk about. And I know that we've got just about 15 minutes for this panel. So I'm just going to say a couple of quick things and open it up for discussion. I also just want to ask when people ask their questions, maybe we can take two or three um, questions together just to make this a little bit more participatory and have as many voices as we can. Um, these are three, I think, very different papers, but all of them are speaking to the idea of the experiment. It seems to me they're all thinking about what it means to experiment, not just with form, but then, you know, what that does to changing the story. I think the um, idea that Robert asked about, you know, what kinds of new stories can we tell. And there's something very interesting, it seems to me, that's happening between text and image uh, in all of these um, presentations and actually your experiments. Um, so there's a kind of um, way in which kind of textual life and worlds appear within the image economies that all of you are um, speaking about. And I want to ask, of course, a question about not having any visuals at all for Simone, which I think is, is very political and, um, and actually deeply meaningful too. 
Um, so anyway, just to just to kind of note that. So I just want to uh, say a couple of things about a couple of um, sentences, if at all, for each of the presentations, and then I'll open it up. I'm going to start actually with Simone's, um, because I think, again, thinking about image, thinking about text, but also I think your own politics of not having any images and not having a presentation at all. And, and I want to think about that as a very meaningful and a thoughtful um, political practice. So I want to ask you about what it means not to see, uh, right, in some sense, because there is such a tremendous focus on actually seeing, and seeing not merely as being visible and present, but as surveillance. Mm -hmm in the kind of narrative that you've given us. So there's something very interesting also that you're saying here about what it means to think about kind of rematerializing black life when it's been dematerialized mm -hmm. and, and rendered either algorithmic or um, racialized within other modes of seeing, especially data, which was something that we um, have been talking a lot about. So I just want to kind of mark that and ask you about that. Um, I think... Um, the, the question of, um, you, you, you talk a lot about the question of biography and autobiography, it seems to me, in what you presented to us. Um, what is the relationship between, as you said, in a couple of places, there's me looking at you um, and looking at you from the side of, uh, side of my eye. So the question of the biography of a community, which clearly is very much at the heart of the kinds of practices that you're thinking through, and autobiography, so where is the self and where is, uh, where is the biography of a community um, in, in what you presented to us? And, and I think this, this question of kind of labor, this, this beautiful way in which you speak about braiding and the activity of braiding, incredibly intimate, um, private in some ways, but as the space where if you actually watch the conversation, you said it's over three hours long, so if you actually have the patience to stay with the rhythm of braiding, um, that's what we get by following you through on this kind of you know, virtual conversation. Um, and again, this, this question of kind of labor, the work of the hands, of the women that you're engaging. And I think you're also making a lot of tactical decisions, as did Simone, about what can be seen and not seen. So the spaces of braiding are actually kind of uh, dark spaces, spaces that you don't want us to explore too carefully, as you said, with your engagement with the um, Nigerian in, in the braiding um, salon. Um, so just, just thinking again about this relationship between what it means to think of a kind of biography and autobiography when race and um, the gendered body and queerness are really at issue. How much do we want to see? How much do we not want to reveal? Um, and then I guess Robert, finally, the, I, I wish we had seen Istanbul and Mumbai. <laughs> um, I think was, was my own, uh, that's my own comment. But it was interesting to me that, you know, we had um, had a talk, the, the keynote that had spoken about the kind of parsimony of, uh, of information or the, the parsimony of the algorithm. And in many ways, it seems like, you know, your project is really pushing against that by giving us a plethora of different modes and means of media and communication. And so I kind of wanted to ask you about that um, and kind of responses of navigating the site where we're getting so much textual inc information that's being encoded through the, through the images and the way that people are navigating the site. And I wanted to just ask you about that, uh, the relationship between plethora and plenitude in some sense of the kind of text that you're working with and parsimony, and just to speak of that as a kind of methodological decision as well, um, but also uh, the kind of story you want to tell us about, about uh, the history of a city, I suppose. Because what I saw with, with Berlin was really the way in which land gets made into territory, gets then made into urban land, and then becomes the site of real estate and speculation. And was that a kind of narrative that you could use for all four of the cities that you were working with? What were the com comparables? Um, and you spoke about comparison at some point. Um, so just kind of wondering about that. Um, but with that, um, I'm just going to open to questions. Uh, and, and then maybe you can come back and respond to, to your question. Okay. Maybe, or if you wanted to do that first. I, Up to you. 
I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> yeah, go. It seems like you had something to say. Um, sure. Um, I, this is actually the first time I've given a paper without visuals. I mm. usually do um, visual studies. In fact, this morning, before I got here, I was looking at um, the different memes on Twitter of my FBI agent. He's watching me through my camera so I can use from my class um, later on. But um, so when I said the, the Maliks and the Nas, plural, it's actually a riff on Winter's essay where she's talking about Ivan from How Do They Come and uh, Rahim from Do the Right Thing. So she mm -hmm. continually repeats the Ivans and the Rahims. And um, to get to your question, um, often when we are doing these lists or maybe these visual moments, it's often of dead black people. Yeah. So I, and those lists are mm -hmm. important in many ways. Uh, Sandra Bland, Ayanna Bird, um, Philando Castile, Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, and, and, and the list continues. But those accounting practices, yeah. and particularly when it comes um, to the visual, the ways in which mm -hmm. um, black death gets circulated online, um, uh, in news feeds, um, you know, they're troubling. If this is the only way that we can understand black life is that, uh, and consume it, is through black death. And so I wanted to maybe make a, a, mm -hmm. a, a political intervention in that way around aesthetic choices and, and, the, and maybe not the choice to display <clears throat> at these moments, but to think around um, these questions and, uh, and particularly um, Wendy's question of our, who are our neighbors mm -hmm. and what it means to love, sorry. <clears throat> I mean, I'll, I can jump in Sorry. after Simone and just yeah. talk about some of my decisions, um, thinking about uh, morning or that, um, you know, presenting uh, images of uh, black individuals of, you know, depending on which side of the scenario you are on, you know, looking at a community, looking into a culture. You know, we do a lot of that when we are mapping or doing data visualizations. We're looking at a thing, we're trying to quantify it, we're trying to visualize it, we're trying to represent it, and what that means to simplify, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to take and flatten and simplify in that way. Um, also, I feel it was extremely powerful, um, and there was a lot of seeing and looking that I did with Simone just at the podium as herself, that some of that writing some of what she is talking about is already mm -hmm. scripted on her, um, and so, you know, why have the why have the images? Um, so there was a, a wonderful uh, question uh, and answer in mm -hmm. the moment for me um, with Simone not having any of the the images. Um, and then you asked about the, well, you talked about this idea of labor in mourning or and for me uh, as a graphic designer, I think some of that uh, the, the the sort of um, the time that we spend making work is quite invisible. You have to make something that's, that that um, proves itself, that seems uh, reliable, and uh, you know that's the work. Um, and I and I collaborate with uh, developers, and there's an enormous amount of work uh, and time and labor that goes in. Um, these projects are coded by hand, so we're not using any templates. We are experimenting, we're exploring, and so also um, you know think about time in that way. How to produce digital works that honor some of that uh, labor that goes into, mm -hmm. um, into the practice. Thank you. I'll just um, I'll say a few, a few words about the sort of um, the, te the techniques of, of representation in the, in the piece and its relationship to, I, I think parsimony is a, a really good word, um, because there was a desire to, to push back on the way that um, uh, perhaps even just personally the way I normally work, which is a lot of that material is present, but then it gets mm -hmm. compressed and abstracted mm -hmm. away into sort of more standard cartography, trying to come up with the symbology um, that re represents some of those things. And um, at a moment of, of sort of deciding what it was going to be, uh, making the, the decision to keep all of that open and on the table as sort of a maximal approach to it mm -hmm. and, and see what we could pull together in that way. Um, and I think especially because uh, Prior to this piece, I've uh, had a, a, a number of projects that dealt primarily with data, and it's almost um, a desire to kind of get, get away from those mm -hmm. projects a little bit and, and work with, with other types of media in a, in a way that was still, in, in my opinion, cartographic and had the potential for um, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of thick or complex descriptions of place rather than trying to distill it into sort of a single legible story. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess we can open it up. Can we can we maybe take three three questions at a time? Would that just to kind of maximize the conversation and um, for maximal inclusion? Uh, 
Hi. Uh, my question is for Simone. Um, thank you uh, for all your insights on the topic. I'm thinking a lot about your introduction. Um, and if uh, perhaps you have any additional insights on uh, the ways in which uh, uh, trans embodiment, or rather, or more broadly, the material conditions of queerness might become sites of resistance within the hegemonic colonial structures that you are describing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was probably thinking along the lines of, um, and Kathy Cohen's work is very important here, around thinking of uh, queerness as a practice as uh, outside of it being um, an identity formation. Um, and, and when you look at who is at the forefront of um, the Black Lives Matter movement, so for example, um, not only in the US, but also in Canada, uh, in Toronto in particular, how um, with many uh, queer, um, uh, femme, uh, gender nonconforming uh, uh, who uh, basically shut down Toronto Pride to make demands around um, having a uniformed, not having uniformed officers uh, marching in the parade, but also to have financial support for black, black and brown organizations within the city, and they were able to even get those things along with the Freedom School. So, so more in terms of not necessarily embodiment, but of of like of loving the right of freedom. For, for, for all and what that kind of love allowed for, if it's the shutting down of a, of a highway or protest uh, in that way. So that was more of a, an analytic and a practice, uh, I was thinking in that term. Sorry. 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 <laughs> thank you. Hi. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for your papers. Um, this question is, is also for Simone. But um, so when you were talking about this FBI document and how it kind of was predict, like in the future tense, predicting future kind of backlash against the police, I was thinking about Wendy's claim that like models tend to put futures in in place that are just abstractions of the past, right? Mm -hmm. And that. The future, like this, is the future that will come true if the same thing, i.e., anti-black violence, continues to happen. Um, which kind of, and then recalled to me, or its kind of intervention at the end of your paper earlier about how can we kind of conceive of alternate temporalities, um, mm. or how can we intervene into the temporality whereby kind of future, the kind of future will, or like the the past inheres in the present, but so does the future, right? So, kind of we will this this likelihood of kind of backlash against the police necessarily like puts in puts the future and puts in puts into place a future where there's just more anti-black violence and I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about kind of how the temporality of that document or how you conceive of like intervening into temporality in activist work or academic work or mm -hmm. if that makes sense well, I'd probably just do academic work. Okay, oh, sorry. And we're I'll just take one more one question. More. Yeah, we, we're just going to take one more question and then sure. I think bring it to a close. So. Uh, or maybe not. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Please. Yeah. Um, I guess, I, yeah, so I really just do um, academic work, but I look towards people doing, uh, who are abolitionists. And uh, as Ruthie Gilmore would say, it's something that you have to imagine or understand is going to happen in your lifetime. So it's, a, not, a, it's not a future put so um, far um, in advance because these, you know, these, these declassified documents, these leaked documents are alibis for the state's um, violence. And so they are, they're almost always going to actualize in the way that, we, like in Texas now, there's someone being held um, on a black identity extremist kind of charge. Um, he was, uh, when they um, raided, so people who, black people who are um, Second Amendment uh, rights activists, he, when, they, when they raided his house, they found the copy of Negro with guns. Um, and you know, that, that becomes part of the, um, uh, the documents that used to substantiate that he is a, um, a, a threat to, to the state. Um, so, so those, but that's why I look at the role of artists um, and, and creative works. And I, I recently came across um, an artist, um, T Tamar Clark Brown, that's doing some work on black women's hair braiding, and I think the connections are here, and encryption. Uh, and they're wearing uh, GoPro as they braid each other's hair, and then through some type of um, algorithm that's in, that's, I don't know how they're doing it, but they're making it in some type of code um, to rethink the ways that, um, I guess, uh, and it, it points very much to, to your coding mm -hmm. around the braiding salon here, but, um, uh, 
to see black women's knowledge production and the physical labor of, of braiding as a way of challenging the ways in which we are hyper surveilled, how things, as you say, get written on our, on our bodies. And I think mm -hmm. your work does that. If you could say a bit more about that. Sure. Too. Um, when I was um, responding um, earlier, I was talking about myself as a designer, but my work as a designer as I move through spaces outside of home is to reassert the value of black women and sort of black material culture. So thinking about hair braiding as something that often um, isn't raised up to the same uh, standard or talked about within the academy along with other kinds of new media practices, along with other kinds of visual production, thinking about that labor, thinking about the mathematics involved, the precision involved, the ideas around uh, tension that are involved that maybe you could see in other professional like engineering and all of those things. So re reasserting value in some of these practices and talking about them um, in tandem with other um, things that I, that I uh, speak to my students about, like uh, pattern, um, you know, digital tools, thinking about um, measuring and all of these uh, different things. Think about 3D printing and fabrication and how we can learn from these uh, practices. Um, and again, coding by hand, this rule-based closed system that can uh, produce uh, variables, um, I think is always an interesting analogy for me um, in relationship to braiding. Thank you. Thank you.